Okay, welcome everyone to part two of Make Your Wildlife Observations Count. And this is how not to record. So as I mentioned earlier, we in the previous webinar, we went through what the basics of a biological record are and the, the things that you really need to make your biological record usable uh, and accept so that it can be accepted into a recording uh, database, biological records database. This week, I'm going to go through some of the pitfalls that people fall into. So quite often, when data managers like myself and, and Buckingham Milton Keynes Environmental Record Centre receive the data, there are, there are certain things that go wrong uh, fairly often. So I'm just going to go through a few of them. And I'm afraid some of it is... Uh, is going into grid references in a bit more detail, but hopefully with the information that I'll give you, it means that you won't fall into those pitfalls that so many others do. Uh, so the four topics that I'm gonna to cover uh, this evening are understanding grid references, site names, recording when you go on a walk, and iNaturalist. And I'm, the last thing I'm gonna go through quite briefly, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on grid references first. So just to recap, the basics of a biological record, there are four components to any biological record that it must have in order for it to be accepted into a biological recording database. And they are the who, so the, the recorder, the determiner, the person that's making the record. And that's really important so that we can go back to that person if we've got any questions, et cetera. Um, the what, so the species or the organism being recorded, uh, what we, discussed last week was that a binomial scientific name is really really useful common names can vary by region vary by family sometimes even even so there can be confusion there and and some sometimes different species have the same common name which can lead to confusion as well where the where is the location of the record and we discussed last week uh, how we prefer grid references for that and we're going to go into that in a bit more detail today and then when is just really the date of the record. Now, we can accept a year, things like that, but a, a specific date is really the, the gold standard that we would like for a record. We also discussed how records can be improved by adding in the how. So things like the number of traps that you use if you were trapping something, or the number of quadrats you used if you were uh, looking at squares on the ground, uh, uh, if you as part of a botany survey, it might be the amount of time you spent searching, etc. And we also talked about the why. So adding things in like habitat is really useful as well. Uh, and for example, if you were recording some kind of insect that you find on plants, you might record the host plant, etc. So that's what we covered last week. Now we're going to go a bit further into grid references, and I'm going to go through some of the the common mistakes that, that we see with regards to grid references. So before we talk about grid references, I just want to mention the term georeference. Now a georeference is a set of geographic coordinates relating to a specific point or area on a map. So it's those X and Y coordinates. And in when we're talking about a location data of a biological record, there are two basic types of georeference. I say basic, there's nothing basic about understanding them, if I'm honest. There's latitude and longitude, which they, what we need to understand about those is they depict a curved surface using ellipsoid. So if you think about the Earth, they're, the, they're those angles that go around from the North Pole to the South Pole and from the equator um, around the world going up, up as well. So you've got those X and Y. And they, on a map, when we're looking at things on a map, they refer, they refer to a point rather than a square. So they refer to a specific point and the accuracy of that uh, location data is plus or minus X number of meters and that defines a radius around the point. So if we map something on, on this map here, he says, it would be a point there with a radius of, let's say that, I, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, they look like one kilometre square, so that's probably a radius of around a kilometre. And so that's how that would look on a map. We'd know that the record is somewhere within that circle. Um, not necessarily in the centre. 
And then we have northings and eastings. So again, these depict a curved surface using ellipsoids, but these refer to a square rather than a point. So the coordinates give us the bottom left-hand corner of the square, and the record can be anywhere in that square going to the right and up. So on this map here, the blue square there gives us an example of a grid reference. So we can see there that there is a bit of difference between the two. And the system that we use in biological recording is usually uh, northing and easting, specifically what we call uh, the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain. So the maps that you're used to seeing are the OSGB uh, ellipsoid, essentially. Right. So we can convert lat long into a grid reference. That's not a problem. There's software there, out there to do it. It would be quite complicated to do it mathematically. I wouldn't have a clue where to start. But some clever boffins have written lovely formulas to do that which is great because quite often you need to get all of your data when you're using it. So data users will need to get it all in the same format. However, there is a problem with converting lat long to good references and vice versa. And that's because if we go back to that previous slide, we can see one's a square, one's a circle. And one is laid on a grid system, whereas the other is the point location. So those differences mean that when we're converting lat long and grid references, we can translocate the record. So the record can move because of that. Uh, so that's why we always ask, if possible, try and use a grid reference when doing biological recording. I'm just going to show you on this map how conversion can lead to a problem. So we've got an area in Buckinghamshire here, and we've got a record here that has been gathered using that long, and we can see the radius that it falls within. Now, if we convert that to a grid reference, it's taken this square here, which is, covers, it's got the biggest proportion of the circle, because we've got a square here, a square here, and a square here as well. But when we're displaying that record now, we're saying that that record could be in this area here where we know actually it wasn't from the lat long. And we're, we're not saying it could be any in any of these areas here. So it does mean that the record, we, we could be giving the wrong information about where the record is here. So if it was at Middle Lodge, for example, it would be displaying incorrectly um, once we convert it into a grid square. And then if somebody comes along and converts that grid square into a lat long, we get this red circle here, and that's where that would display. So when we're converting from one to the other, we can translocate the record. But the more we convert them back and forward, which may happen as people download the data and use it, the more this record can, can be moved. And I've actually seen records be moved quite considerably because of this process. Um, to go back to the record, if the record was there after one translocation, after two translocations, it's being, it's, we're saying it's in the wrong place. Same for that, same for that, same for that. There we'd, we wouldn't have really, it would be fine, but we can see that there's there's a lot of margin for error there. So that's why we ask that where possible, if you can always give it as an actual grid reference figure. Right, so to go back to grid references and understanding resolution, on this map on the left-hand side here, we can see, let's say I've gone to Burnham Beaches and I've made a record. Um, and I know it's in this grid square here, this four figure grid square, square, this one kilometer, but I want to try and do something that's a, I want to try and give a more precise record. On the right hand side, we can see that we've added an extra seven and an extra two, and we've got it down to this square here. Okay. Let's say we want to try and get it even more precise. These are the maps when we go down to eight figure. So you can see on the Ordnance Survey map, I'm no longer able to, to get any kind of resolution there. Uh, and this is the satellite image of the same area. So I've got a quick question for you here. 
with my record in Burnham Beaches of, let's say it's a gray squirrel that I saw in the woods, which grid reference do you think would be the most appropriate? So I've just launched a poll and to make it a bit simpler for you as well, I've explained what, what the area uh, for each of those size of grid references. So should it be in a 10 figure grid reference, one meter square? Should it be an eight figure grid reference, a 10 meter square? Should it be a six figure, which is a hundred meter? Four figure, which is a kilometer? Or two figure, which is a 10 kilometer square? Yeah. All right, okay. And the, it's all anonymous. I can't see who's voted for what, but it's just, it's really good if you can all have a guess because then we can kind of see what people think. All right, okay. Well, I'm gonna end that poll and share the answers and just go through my thoughts, but I will invite Julia to, to jump in as well with her thoughts too. Um, so 11% of you, three of you have said a 10 figure, a one meter square. I can tell you right now in the middle of a woodland, not a chance of getting that accuracy. I definitely can't ground truth that on a map because we can see here, it's just a sea of trees. There's no way, and these squares here are 10 meter squares. So a meter would be a tiny little square within that. There's no way you could get it that accurate. So there's no point, oh, I give you the wrong question. That, should, that shouldn't say if you're undertaking a garden bird watch, it should say for this one. Um, that question's coming in a second. <laughs> um, yeah. So some people have said eight figure, a 10 meter square. Some people have said six figure, a hundred meter square. Some people have said a kilometer square. And I'm sorry for the confusion with the question there because I, I forgot to edit the question for this um, specific slide. So because I'm going to stop sharing, because this, um, this habitat is quite, we can see it's, it's a woodland, it's not the habitat isn't changing every couple of meters it's not like an urban environment where we've got gardens next to something really urban next to a park next to a canal etc we can see that the the habitat is is quite consistent across the whole area so actually even a one kilometer square here would be useful uh 100 100 meter square would be brilliant anything more precise than that i think it's your grid reference is probably going to be less accurate than you can say. So there's little point in doing that. Uh, Julia, have you got anything you'd like to add? Would you say that, would you say that's fair? Six figure ideal? Six figure, I would have said, particularly in woodland is, is uh, it's pretty accurate. You can get to six figure. Yeah. And it kind of reflects, you know, you can, you, you, if you can look at a hundred meter square, you know, you, the reasonable chance of being in that anything, more detailed, I, th I don't think that's probably good. I think 100 meter is perfect. Yeah. And I think something to add to that is even if you, even if you've got the most precise GPS in the world, please bear in mind that sometimes they do lie about how accurate they are, not on purpose, purpose. they're not trying to, but sometimes they, I think, have false confidence in their own accuracy. Because when you ground truth it on a map, they're not quite where, where they should have been. Um, but even if you could get it down to 10 metres, I'd argue what, what use is that going to be? And any use of that data in that woodland, a 100 metre resolution is going to be fine. Right, OK. Right, so moving on. Then I'm going to ask you the exact same question again, but this time I want you to answer it for the question on the screen. And I apologise to anybody who answered it for that in the last one. So I want you to imagine your own garden. And I'm going to ask you to watch your garden for an hour and record all the birds you see landing in your garden, including on the fence. But outside of the fence, flying above, don't include them. And I want you to tell me which of the grid references there you think would be appropriate for your garden. Should it be a one metre square? Should it be a 10 metre square? 100 metre square? One kilometre square? Or a 10 kilometre square? And um, I'll just give you a couple of seconds to fill that in. Again, I can't see who's put what. Uh, and yeah, right. A few more of you, come on. We can get a few more over the line. Perfect, right, I'm gonna end that poll now. All right, okay, I'm gonna share the answer here, right. So you can see a couple of people have went for one meter square. Again, I'd argue there's no need for that level of 
accuracy and it's imp it's very difficult to get it. Uh, some of you have put a 10 meter square, some 100 meter, uh, one kilometer square, and nobody has gone for 10 kilometer square. Great. So 10 kilometer square, definitely too broad. One meter square, definitely too accurate. One kilometer square, usually, usually, yeah, I'd say we could get more accurate than that. Um, it might depend on where your garden fits on the actual OS uh, grid, but 67%, 18 of you have went for a 10 meter square and 27 of you have went for, no, sorry, six of you have went for a six figure, 100 meter square. And there's no right or wrong here because it depends on your garden. So sometimes your grid reference isn't just about how accurate your GPS is giving you, uh, it's about the size of the area that you're looking at. So my garden, a 10 meter, a 10 meter square wouldn't work because the 10 meter square goes right through the middle of my garden, even though it isn't much bigger than a 10 meter square. Uh, yeah, it isn't much bigger than a 10 meter square. Because of where it falls, actually a 100 meter square works better because that will the 100 meter square that I'd record in would give all of the garden. So my advice to you with this is that 100 meter square is definitely fine for this anyway. But the point is some people have bigger gardens than others. Some people have gardens that fall on a grid, a grid square line. So there's not always a right or wrong answer with this or a definitive answer. Right, okay, right, on to the next one. Right, so understanding resolution. So this is a screenshot that I took from my phone, my smartphone today of OS Locate. So OS Locate is an app for getting grid references. And you can see here in the middle, it gives me a grid reference. Now I can set that to 10 meters, six meters, uh, not 10 meters, 10 figure, six figure, eight figure. I can set it to any of those. And I purposefully set it to 10 figure today, which I never normally use, and took a screenshot. And we, like I said, we can see the uh, we can see the 10 figure grid reference there. That is giving me an accuracy of a one meter square. So that grid reference is saying that whatever I'm recording, etc., is within that one meter square. So if I was recording a bird and I was using that to get a grid reference, I need to be standing right next to that bird because it's a one meter square. But what we also see is this second bit here gives us an accuracy of plus or minus 24 meters. So I've got a one meter square there that is accurate to 24 plus or minus 24 meters. So it's not an accurate grid reference. So this is just a word of warning. When you're using GPS devices such as uh, smartwatches, smartphones, or a GPS handset, you need to look at what the accuracy is. So with this, I should only really be using a six figure, a hundred meter grid square, because even a 10 meter grid square, which would be an eight figure grid reference is not going to be appropriate because it's just not accurate enough. If it's plus or minus 24 meters, and we're saying it's within a 10 meter square, uh, we could be way out. So just a word of warning with that. So what that means is on this, I can easily solve the problem by changing the settings so that it gives me a six figure grid reference. Another way of doing it though, is if you're dealing with grid references in the, in the old fashioned traditional way is you can shorten it. So here we've got a grid reference and I've been, I've been a bit helpful here with the diagram as well, but I want you to tell me which of the bottom A or B is the correctly shortened grid reference. Uh, I'm gonna launch another quick poll. And I'm only gonna give you 20 seconds to answer this. Um, so is the correctly shortened grid reference A or B? How would you shorten that grid reference to convert it from a 100 meter square to a one kilometer square? Because remember, if we're shortening a grid reference, we're making the area less precise. Right, okay. I'm going to end that poll now. I'm going to share the results. Right, so we're a bit divided. Three quarters have gone for B and one quarter have gone for A. This is one of the most common mistakes with biological recording. 
people trying to shorten a grid reference and shorten it in the incorrect way. The 77% are right. And there was a bit of a clue there in that I've color coded the numbers. So we can see that the different components of a grid reference refer to different parts of the grid, the grid that we're using. So the two letters refer to the 100 kilometer square. And then the first number in the northings and the first number in the eastings are colored the same color, they're red. And they refer to the X and Y coordinate of the 10 kilometer square. The blue numbers are the X and Y coordinate of the one kilometer square and the pink numbers for the 100 meter square. So if we're gonna shorten a grid reference, we need to make sure that when, we're, first of all, we take off an even number. So we must, have to, we must take off an X and a Y coordinate and we need to take them off from the right place. So B is actually the correct answer. We need to remove both of the pink numbers to change it from a 100 meter square to a one kilometer square. And if we were going to shorten that even further and make it accurate to 10 kilometers, we'd then take out the blue numbers. So we'd end up with the grid reference SO49. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, this is that grid reference, the original grid reference to the 100 meter square. So it's uh, not far from Shrewsbury, Church Stretton. This is what happens when we shorten it the incorrect way. The grid reference now refers to a site in Monmouthshire in Wales. And if we, correct, if we correctly do it, we can see it's still there in Shropshire, but a little bit less precise. So this may seem like a rather minor mistake, but it has quite significant consequences as to the data. And this is the result why Julia will sometimes deal with bat roost records that are in the middle of the sea. Um, because somebody's shortened a grid reference and they've shortened it in the incorrect way and it's translocated that into the North Sea as a result. Um, when you're shortening grid references, you always take numbers off and you don't round up or down. Rounding will translocate as well. So what I find the most useful way of doing it is to write the grid reference on a piece of paper and cross them out like I have here. And then I'll double check that grid reference uh, in something like grid reference finder afterwards to make sure that it, it looks correct. Okay, right. So finally, uh, so in grid references, <laughs> submitting grid references. If you're submitting your data through iRecord, when you type your grid reference in here, so we've got a 10 figure grid reference. I think we're in Slough here, yeah. Um, this is Marlborough Road in Slough, and this is, no, it's not. This is my house. This is, we're in Harrow, sorry. Yeah, Slough would be a, a different letters. Uh, that's coming up later. So this was that 10, that 10 meter, uh, one meter grid reference that I got earlier, the 10 figure one. I, when, I, when you enter your grid reference into iRecord, it will show up on the map. So this is a really good way of ground truthing if the record is where you thought it was. Now, I will take grid references all the time when I'm out and about using my phone. And when I put them into iRecord, sometimes they're not where they should have been because I'll know that, oh, I found that, I saw that at a bus stop or uh, at the, where this path meets that path. So I can see when I put it on the map that it's a little bit uh, translocated. And I will then correct that by selecting the right square on the map. Uh, you can also use iRecord to shorten the grid reference, because if you zoom out, um, you can select this, the actual square that you want. Now, iRecord has a little plus sign here, which allows you to change the base map. Now, the, when you're zoomed out, you can't see the satellite image. When you zoom in a bit more, like I was on that one there, you can see the satellite image by changing it by clicking on the plus. And that's a little known feature that a lot of people don't really realize, but I find it really useful. Uh, when you're zooming in and out on the map, just be aware that at a certain point when you zoom out, this zoom bar gets a little bit shorter. And I quite often accidentally click on the square underneath it because of that. All right, okay. Right, a couple of little tips for good references. I mentioned these websites in the last webinar, but I just thought I'd, I'd give you a quick screenshot and show you. So. Qcara, I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it, is really good 
for seeing the grid squares. As you zoom in and out, you can, uh, you can see how the grid squares are. And it's what I use for a lot of my screenshots on this webinar. There's a little symbol here, it looks like a funnel. If you click on that, just like with iRecord, you can change the background map. So you can change between a satellite image and, you can change, and the Ordnance Survey maps, which is really, really useful. Uh, grid Reference Finder is really good for dropping a pin. You just right click on the map wherever you want and you can drop a pin and it will give you a 10 figure and a six figure grid reference. Um, I normally just use the six figures. It also gives you the eastings and northings, the latitude, the longitude, etc. And the nearest address. Now, this won't be necessarily the correct address. It, if you're in the middle of the countryside, it will be a nearby address. Um, it's really useful because you can search by postcode, location, grid reference, lat long, etc. even what three words. So it's just worth, it, it's a good tool for playing around with. But then if you want to see exactly what the grid reference you're saying is, once you've got a grid reference from here, you can type that into QCARA and it'll highlight the exact square. So that it, I, use, I use both of them. A third one that's really useful is a tool from the Bedfordshire Natural History Society. Uh, the links there, I'll, I'll send this link out uh, with the webinar, don't worry, the recording. And that allows you to see side by side Norman survey map uh, and a satellite image. Now you can zoom in, There's, the interface can be a little bit tricky to use sometimes, but it is good, it is good for looking at them side by side. Uh, this is Prince's Risborough in Buckinghamshire. All right, okay. So just a little bit of a summary with georeferences. My top tips are use good references, not that long. Try to avoid conversions so that we can prevent translocation. Think about the good reference resolution. More precise is not necessarily more accurate. Your, the resolution of your grid reference should be accurate to the device you're using to find it and for the area that you're recording. Think about whether a really precise grid reference is even gonna make any difference into how that data can be used. If you need to shorten a grid reference, for example, you might wanna anonymize your home if you're re recording in your garden, etc then ensure that you do so correctly, again, to avoid translocation. So translocation of the record, moving it to a place where it's not is really what we're trying to avoid here. Um, and like I said, beware of using GPS. Check the accuracy and let that influence what grid reference you're going to use. But also be wary because sometimes the accuracy that it states is maybe not as accurate as it is. I'd always recommend... Uh, then double checking when you've got some time at home, either popping it when you put the record into iRecord or even after you've submitted it, you can check it on Grid Reference Finder. And if you need to amend the grid reference on iRecord, et cetera, you can. Uh, and like I said, if using through iRecord, always check the record on the map as well. Always have a quick look. Like I said, I would say I change about a third of my records from the grid references I've got in the field um, because because of the fact that the accuracy has been a bit out. Right, okay, so that's good references. Site names you won't spend as much time on. Uh, why do we even need to put a site name? For given a grid reference, why do we need to write down the name of where we're recording? Well, we need to do that for clarification about where the record is. So here we've got Churchwood and Leith Grove. And we've got a grid square here where we've made a record. Now, that record includes stuff in Churchwood, but also stuff in this field here. So if we're recording for the site of Churchwood, knowing that it's in Churchwood is really useful because then that will be included in any species list for that site. Whereas if it's, out, if it's outside here and we've put that it's on Joe's farm, then it wouldn't be included. So it helps us clarify where a record is when we've got grid squares that obviously cover multiple sites. Secondly, it's really useful for verification. Oh. Uh, so again, we go back to that example where that record was translocated because the grid reference was shortened incorrectly. 
if we've got a site name, even if that site name is just uh, Church Stratton, that would tell us that something's wrong when it's appearing in Monmouthshire. So it enables us to double check whether the record's accurate or not. Uh, when data users talk about verification, they're quite often talking about verifying the species ID, but verifying the location is really, really important as well. And it's the both georeference geo verification and species ID verification are important, important parts of check, checking the uh, accuracy of a record. Right, so defining a site name. So I've got a couple of tips for this. First of all, be consistent. So we've got Churchwood here. Um, this could, this, you could call this Churchwood, you could call it Churchwood uh, Hedgerly, you could call it um, Church Woods, could be another one, that, another name that people would call it. I've got a couple of tips that I would give you for using it. First of all, what I do, because I'm guilty of this, I'm guilty of changing the site name every time I go there. So, for example, Hampstead Heath in London is divided into different sections. Sometimes I record it as Hampstead Heath. Sometimes I'll I'll say I'm on Hampstead Heath colon uh, Hampstead Heath extension. Sometimes I'll put Hampstead Heath colon extension. Sometimes I'll just put Hampstead Heath extension. Being consistent with the names makes it easier for data managers to collate records that are all from the same site. My tip and what I've started doing is I look it up on Google Maps and I use whatever the site name is for that, unless I think it's definitely wrong. Um, so here I would call it Churchwood or Churchwood comma Hedgerly, something like that. And then I just make sure that I use that same system again and again from now on. And I've learned to do this the hard way because I manage a data set that includes my own recordings and I'm one of the people that is guilty of, of being inconsistent with this. And it, it's hard to be consistent unless you have quite a, a rigid system, which is why now I go to Google Maps and look at what is there and I'll just use the terminology that they've used so that I'm making myself be consistent. It would be even better if we can all be consistent with each other, but I think we've got to take it one minute at a time. If you can all just be consistent for yourselves and that'll be, that'll be really useful. And my second, point that I want to bring up is residential areas. So when we're recording on a nature reserve, it's quite good, quite, we're quite good at getting that site name down because the nature reserve has a name and we all give it that. If we're going to record from our garden, so I've now moved to Slough from my Harrow residence earlier on, and I've moved to a place called Marlborough Road. Uh, so this is Marlborough Road. You can see I've a robin was plucking an earthworm out of my, um, what may be a plastic lawn there, uh, and uh, I'm making a record of it on iRecord. So quick question for you all. What do you think I should call my site name? What should I put in the location name here? Uh, you might want to think about things like consistency. You might want to think about personal data. Maybe I don't want people to know that it's my address, or maybe I'm really proud. Uh, so, yeah, what do you think? Now, bear in mind as well what I've been saying about what we use the site name for. So there'll also be a habitat field where I can state what habitat it was in. Right, okay, right, we've got most of the votes in, let's see. Right, okay, most popular option is Marlborough Road Slough. What I will tell you all is there is no definitive right answer here. There's what myself and Julia might prefer for our data sets, but there isn't, there isn't a proper convention for this. And perhaps we need one to make it a bit simpler for people. Um, so nobody's went for back garden. I'd agree, back garden tells us the habitat it is, a, it is a garden. My garden tells us that I live there and it's given away personal data that, that, that as data managers, the Buckinghamshire, a Milton Keynes Environment Record Centre might want to blur that. So they don't necessarily want to know it's my garden. They want to know it's a garden and they not want to know where it is. 21 Mara Road, SL37JY. So again, if there's anything in that record that gives away that it might be my garden, we're giving away personal information. So just to be on the safe side, I anybody who gives something a site name like this, 
I'll take off the number and take out the postcode. Marlborough Road's fine. However, there will be Marlborough Roads all over the country. So actually verifying the location if there's a problem with the grid reference might be a bit tricky. So Marlborough Road Slough, which 63% of you have gone for, is probably what I'd prefer. Um, you might, if you're in a big city, you might give the suburb rather than the town. That's fine as well. Again, what I'd ask you to do is just be consistent when you're doing it. Um, so name, comma, town, fine. Uh, even just the town is okay. It won't help with verifying it as much, but yeah. So my preference would be the road and the town. Julia, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Um, we always anonymize them if we get them in with too much detail. So we would anonymize it to Marlborough Road Slough. Yeah. I quite like the comma. It, um, it <laughs> makes our life a lot easier reading them. And laying them out with the road first and the town or the borough second is ideal. So Marlborough Road Slough is exactly what I'd, I'd write. Perfect. OK, I'll tell you what, we're going to set that convention now. We're going to spread the word with the other record setters and recording schemes that this is how we're doing it from now on. So Perfect. you heard it here first, guys. It all started with Marlborough Road in Slough. Who'd have thought? Right. OK. So let's get rid of that. Right, okay, moving on. Right, just a couple more things and then we'll get to the questions. So recording on walks. So this is something that quite a lot of people will do. They'll go for a walk and they'll make a list of things that they saw on their walk. So I'm gonna go walk on a walk in Westwood, which again, this is somewhere in Buckinghamshire, but I forgot where. And I'm gonna come in this entrance here. I'm gonna walk along this path and up to here and then out there. And I'm going to make a list of all the things that I see, and I'm going to send it to Buckinghamshire Environmental Record Centre. We've got a little bit of a problem here, because if you can see the blue lines on that image, they denote the one kilometre square. So we can see that my walk has actually gone through not one, not two, but three kilometer squares and then one, two, three, I should have counted these earlier, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and ten hundred meter squares. So if I just give one list of records to the record center, technically I should give them a 10 kilometer square, assuming that they're all of those one kilometer squares are within the same 10 kilometer square. Uh, however, if I divide up my records into red, blue, and purple, uh, so I divide them into three groups as I'm walking along, then I can give the one kilometre square. Or I could go a step further, and the, the, the ideal would be to do them in 100 metre squares. Um, so what I tend to do with this, because it can be quite tricky keeping an eye on the GPS, whatever. If I know I'm going on a walk somewhere like Westwood, I might actually plan my route a little bit in advance and kind of have a map with me so that I've got a rough idea of when I'm in a new 100 meter square so that I can record a separate list for each of them. Um, and it does mean that if I see red squirrels, red squirrels, gray squirrels in Buckinghamshire more likely, if I see gray squirrels in a few different grid squares, I can record them multiple times because like, I've seen them in different places. All right, that's it for recording on walks. Finally, I'm going to end with iNaturalist because we had a few questions about iNaturalist last time. So just to clarify, iNaturalist is a, a smartphone-based app where you record your observations by taking a photo of an organism. And when you submit it into the app, it shares it with fellow naturalists. So they'll look at your photo and they'll make comments about what they think it is. You may have said what it is. You may have said you didn't know. Uh, I naturally saw also has an uh, artificial intelligence algorithm that will look at the photo and make a best guess. Um, so that's how iNaturalist works. A uh, couple of notes about it that I just want to bring up for biological recording, specifically in Buckinghamshire, is that BMERC do not receive iNaturalist records in general. They might get some that come through that then go on to iRecord, but they won't get them as a standard. 
So just be aware, if you want your iNaturalist records to get to BMERC, you need to submit those records to BMERC as well, or through one of the other uh, recording systems. If you submit a record to iNaturalist, you don't then submit it to iRecord because they are linked in some ways as well. If you are going to use iNaturalist, then I've got a couple of recommendations because there are some problems with the data that's coming through that I'm seeing with the earthworms. First of all, check your licensing. So on iNaturalist, you can set two things, licenses for two things. First of all, your photos. And for your photos, you can set whatever license you want, um, whether you want it to be protected so people can't use it or unprotected so that people can use it for whatever. Um, that means that if you put a Creative Commons license on that, uh, or public like by attribution or public domain, it means that people can use your uh, records for commercial reasons. But that won't always be for things that you wouldn't agree with. So I recently produced a course for butterfly conservation on butterflies and moths, or well, two courses, and I trolled uh, not iNaturalist but iRecord and some and used photos that were on there under a CC0 license, a Creative Commons public domain license. I use them in the course because technically it, it's a commercial use because it's for a course that, that um, we're charging butterfly conservation for. So, but it was for an ID quiz uh, on these things. So it's not always gonna be evil multinationals using your photos for things. It might be organizations like the Field Studies Council or Butterfly Conservation. I'd say always check the georeferences and resolution settings. I've seen accuracies of plus or minus 2,000 kilometers, which includes Greenland, parts of Greenland. That was um, reported in a recent uh, newsletter from the Myriapod and Icepod group, which are centipedes, woodlice, and millipedes. So do check that you're not accidentally blurring it to a ridiculous amount. Uh, be aware that those confirming your IDs may have limited experiences. So you may have people agree, agreeing that it's something or telling you that it's not something when it's their best guess. Um, and also understand that the AI can be misleading for some groups. So if you're recording hedgehogs, and I think a lot of plants it's quite good for, but if you're recording fungi and um, or earthworms, it might tell you something completely wrong. So not all animals and plants can, and fungi can be identified from a photograph uh, and where the AI goes wrong it can go off on a tangent so it's now suggesting that all earthworms are pretty much the same species uh, and the more incorrect it gets the more it gets pushed in that direction so sometimes the AI the algorithm gets better sometimes it gets worse um, and on that note I'm going to finish off yet again with some homework uh, please do do some recording uh, what I recommend you do is sign up to iRecord and submit five records from your garden or a local park by the end of next week. Uh, if the weather's like it is today in the southeast, then get out tomorrow and do some recording then. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Stop the recording.